Welcome folks. This is Thursday, January 6th, and this is our nine o'clock meeting. We're a little late, I think, which is part for the course. We just had a little bit of a Zoom time with our former member of the committee, Representative Lynn Batchelor. She um, has moved down out of Vermont. She's down in Florida, and we had a time with her um, just to check in and for her to check in with us. So we spent a little bit of time with Lynn and it was great to see her. Um, this morning, we are going to be working on, on a recommendation <clears throat> from the advisory committee. There was the advisory committee on the state house work throughout the summer and fall. Uh, the first part of our work was geared trying to <laughs> what we were gonna put in place for in-person legislative session beginning in January. Um, so that took up the first couple months, three months of the work of the committee. And then in September, the committee started working on looking at possible expansion of the state house and what that would entail. Uh, we looked at all different options. We looked at uh, plans that were developed back around 2002. Uh, the, the, architectural firm that did that was named Feingold. Um, we then also looked at what Freeman French and Freeman did, their couple studies that they did over the last couple of years. And our recommendation in the end was um, looking at doing the first step of looking at the putting a floor above the cafeteria. When the cafeteria and that whole expansion was put in in the mid to late 80s, we're all under the understanding that the cafeteria was built as a weight bearing uh, floor that could hold the floor above it. Um, and that was done back in the 80s uh, with the intent of possible future expansion down the road. So they built in the capacity for that floor above the cafeteria. So we have said, let's go forward with, <clears throat> with looking at that option, that possibility. And the thinking is that the cafeteria seating area and the kitchen would move up to the top floor, up to that floor. And where the cafeteria and kitchen are now would be converted into about five committee rooms. If we are to use ARPA money, the 113 million, that we talked about last year at the end of the session that might be able to be used for capital projects, eligible capital projects. Those dollars have to be out the door by, by 2026. So in order to expedite this <clears throat> proposal, the advisory committee made a recommendation that in the general fund budget adjustment, the general fund budget adjustment that's upstairs, uh, put in 1.5 million to start allowing the planning and programming to start occurring so that we can really find out if that floor above the cafeteria is a viable option. The administration does not support that. I wanna be very, very clear. That's why it is not in the budget adjustment. And we, um, when we talk with BGS about the options, uh, BGS is part of the administration. So the administration has not been supportive of this to this point. So we have to be sensitive to that. Um, but once, if the 1.5 million does get appropriated, we need to make the decision, is it appropriated to BGS or is it appropriated somewhere else to start doing the planning? and uh, programming work. So that's what we're gonna be talking today with our Sergeant at Orange, Janet Miller, and Tricia Harper, who is now working for the legislative branch in terms of our on-site um, engineer and architect per se for that. So we do have a question, Marsha. Yeah, I just wanna know, did the administration give you any solid reasons as to why they didn't wanna go along with it? There, well, not really. I mean, at the point, I, I can't answer for the administration. Um, 
I think what was happening, there were all these different options that were being talked about. And there was some grand schemes of adding on a wing in the back of the state house on both sides of the state house that extend beyond the footprint of the state house. There's some members of the advisory committee that really wanted to go down that road. It, it's, and that's a big project. Um, I think that this is, I can't speak for the administration, but they have not been supportive of an expansion to date um, of the state house. If that may change as we move forward, that may not change. I don't know. Okay, I, thanks. I can't speak for the administration, but I know in the work of the advisory committee, they were very clear when we took votes because the commissioner of BGS is part of the advisory committee that um, they had to vote no. So, so Joe Asia is here from BGS as is Eric Philcorn. So we have to keep that in mind if there are some delicate questions that occur that we really need definite answers from BGS, they may not be able to give it because they're not at liberty to do that at this point. Is that fair to say, Eric? And I want to thank you for um, understanding and acknowledging our position in the conversation. It was, it was a few years ago that you, uh, you referred to me as a peon in committee and today is a day that I'm very happy to be such. <laughs> You're not a peon too much. <laughs> okay, so with that, um, Janet, should we start with you? Is that what you were thinking or do we start with Trisha? You're muted. Sorry guys, gotta get used to this. I'm not Zoomers like you people are. Yeah, we've um, been building for the last few months too. I know it. I think we should start with Trisha, Madam Chair, because uh, she really has the timeline and the, the expertise to talk about this more than I would. Okay. So Trisha, I'll turn it over to you. So if you could identify yourself for the record. Yes, hi, my name is Trisha Harper. Uh, I'm an architect and I am with my first architectural restoration consulting, uh, PLLC. And um, I have been hired by the legislature or Janet to uh, assist in these matters of expansion or other projects within the building, such as what has just been completed, um, which is the coat room and the restrooms almost completed. And uh, and to explain about the restroom, Tricia, because members uh, have probably have not been following this in detail like we have. Okay. All right. Well, um, a single use restroom was not available within the building, uh, except there was, uh, that was not handicap accessible, um, except for the one that was on the legislative council mezzanine floor, which was not accessible to the general public as easily. So uh, first floor restroom was installed in the uh, infirmary, the infirmary and was made the decision was made for the infirmary to be closed down or uh, not to have to be uh, relocated and um, the restroom took its place. So there'll be a lactation and restroom area. Um, the lactation room is still the same pretty much as it was. It's got a new sink in it, but um, so they are just finishing that up now. The coat room itself has uh, the office that Mike Ferrant sits in, uh, which was a conference room, uh, was expanded so that both he and his and Peggy could sit in there with him. Um, and also the there was an office made for IT help desk, uh, etc. And the mailboxes are in that room too. Um, and the files, uh, which will it is closed off. Now we are waiting for um, the doors to come in again, uh, availability of material is been tough. Um, and we've, those doors were changed in the, uh, to have card readers. So it makes them even more difficult to obtain the, the frames is what it is. So they should be in here pretty soon. We'll have doors eventually hung in those openings uh, to finish off that project. Um, but again, COVID is making things difficult to complete 
uh, in a timely manner, but they did very well. I was very uh, happy with my contractors, um, EF Wall and Millbrook Construction for their work to date in both two break and, and at the state house. So- Tricia, can I just clarify one thing for the committee that when you speak about mailboxes, it isn't members mailboxes, it is for ledge council mailboxes. So the member mailboxes have gone away and we'll have a new procedure for giving you your mail, which will probably be a job more suited for our pages again. So just and so you know. A reminder to some of the committee members that was the discussion that we were doing during the session of 2020 before we were sent home. That could, could we have more space in the state house and not have those mailboxes in the coat room and have the pages maybe deliver our mail. And those were conversations we in the committee initiated with Janet, Sergeant Arms in February of 2020. Mm -hmm. So this is not new um, thinking. It's just a continuation of what we had discussed two years ago. So, and, and, and that project at Two Aiken is not completed. Um, we only did the first, had funding. Uh, we had the funding, but we didn't have the retainer contract process that is set up through that we've been trying to follow, which is uh, the BGS process um, through purchasing. The contracts weren't uh, were restrictive. Uh, the retainer, which allowed us to get the project done by now, or mostly done by now, ninety five percent, because we were able to use those retainer contractor uh, contractors um, and not go through the typical bid process. Uh, they were already um, available to to bid, and the contract was set up if they were awarded the bid. So we. We did that, but it didn't allow us to do the third floor because we didn't, it would extend beyond the um, allowance of the retainer contracts. So we have to rebid that portion of third floor and that work will need to be done if Janet wants to talk more about that uh, at this time, but. Um. So maybe I can interject here just to give some background again to the committee. <clears throat> because we, we know all these moving pieces because we've been living it since June. <laughs> Do the committee members know what we're talking about when we say two Aiken and four Aiken? Remember all that conversation last year at the very end of the session where we negotiated with the administration? It's where BGS used to be at the top of Aiken Ave in a building behind that greenhouse. So during the summer, what occurred is BGS moved to 133 State Street on the top floor and they vacated their office building uh, to Aiken and then four Aiken behind that. As we were working in the advisory committee, it came to light that two Aiken um, had knob and tube wiring. So we were, the thinking at the time had been to move legislative council from the mezzanine in the state house. And also there's some ledge council folks that are in the pink lady on Baldwin street with joint fiscal to move those legislative council folks and locate them all together at two Wake. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion that the legislative council is staffing it was back during the summer and fall been pretty split on that move and um that we realized also that we had to do some renovations inside of two waken in order to have anybody move in there particularly with the wiring it had to be updated there was concern about air conditioning um, and uh, airflow within the building. So in terms of ledge council moving down there at this point, that's still being discussed. In the interim, what has occurred is our human resources person, Eileen, I can't remember her last name. Um, she was in the pink lady and 
then, and we had another person that we were hiring for the human resources office, as well as joint fiscal office was hiring some more folks. So we were really looking at not, avail not enough available space. So we made the decision that uh, the human resources arena for the legislative branch would move down to two Aiken. In order to do that, um, Janet went out to contract um, to have some construction work done at two Aiken, particularly to upgrade the wiring. We could do the first and second floor. There's three floors there. We also, in discussion, when we were looking at space in the state house, losing room nine to a committee room, room nine is the old coat room, um, we needed to find a spot for coats when we returned. So we've been, we were looking at all different scenarios. And we ended up where Ledge Council were Mike Ferrant and Peggy Delaney and um, Mariah and I can't remember the other Charlene. Name. Charlene. Yep. And fitting four people into a small room was not going to work. So we ended up uh, keeping Mike and Peggy in the building because they work directly with legislators and, and the other two are more behind the scenes. So they have moved down to two Aiken. So that was all sort of decided and negotiated between August and November. So those are all the moving pieces here. So, and I know for new members, this is really, really difficult because you haven't been in the building to understand how these old room nine, the coat room, room 10, the lounge, room 11, how all those used to be used. So it's really hard, I'm sure to follow. But are there any questions at this point for that? When we get back in person, I was thinking that maybe it would be good for us to take uh, a little tour of two Aiken, four Aiken, and also where BGS has moved to the top floor on 133 State Street so that we can have a concept of what we're involved in here for that. So did I miss anything, Janet? No, I don't think so. We lived it, didn't we? <laughs> Trisha? Sorry, we're still living it, Madam Chair. Yeah, well, we're still <laughs> living it in a different way. <laughs> OK. So um, that project, you know, that's just the summary on that. So uh, this fall, we did meet several times uh, the committee with uh, that representative Emmons chairs um, the joint legislative management committee is that no it was the advisory uh, committee the, the legislative advisory committee on the state house sorry yeah. um, and that is and part of that meeting was the discussion of um, coming to the conclusion for the funding recommendation for the state house expansion that we're reviewing now was based on um, as Representative Emmons said on these drawings that we had done um, in the past and reviewing things, we also looked, I briefly looked at a, uh, and I don't have this uh, schedule with me to give to you online right now, but the uh, it could be shared. I think it's within that information on the um, Legislative Advisory Committee, but, we reviewed a potential timeline, estimated timeline for producing these documents so that we could use the, 2020, uh, the funding, the ARPA funding before 2026 was the game plan. Um, already two months has been taken out of that schedule because we have to end another two months waiting for the funding if it's appropriated. Um, but it was a very aggressive schedule um, and even more aggressive now with the four months having to be taken out of it too because of this was written in November and um, by the time March rolls around. So, but the concept was if we could get, proceed and 
and develop these uh, concepts for expanding on top of the state house cafeteria and moving the cafeteria up to the third floor, expanding the committee rooms on re renovating the committee rooms that are in the, uh, the existing 30s and 40s so that there's basically only four committee rooms on each floor um, along with a, a link over to the third the addition to the cafeteria, um, then it would be a, uh, a good start for this concept of developing um, and expanding the state house, which, which is needed in order for you to function in these house committee rooms, uh, especially under these times that we're under. So that is, um, That is where we're at right now. If, if a RFP for architectural services could go out for schematic design and design development for 1.5 million is what we were giving a rough estimate for that um, 150, not 1.5 million, sorry. But uh, yeah, 1.5 million for this funding for developing these drawings. Um, we'd be ahead of the game and be and potentially being able to at least get through phase one of construction by 2026 and hopefully both phases of construction because during the, um, the legislative session, we would have to pause uh, construction um, in order for you to be able to meet within the building uh, and then to start construction again. But, um, that is the intent, is to provide a new cafeteria, a larger cafeteria, provide newer committee rooms, uh, commit larger committee rooms for the house. And um, I think that is the main scope of it. The big question is about uh, ledge council and such like that and their location um, and the uh, legislative staff, um, but the uh, mezzanine would basically stay as it is uh, the, in this plan. And there would be a review of potential um, uh, how we approach the building as, as we are doing now, we're entering on the loading dock side of the building and addressing that entry so that both um, we had it, it reviewed by uh, the fire marshal that, that that stair and ledge council could actually come out that when you first come in to the building and it's just a stair that brings you up to the lead mezzanine ledge council area, that stair is a repetitive stair and it doesn't need to be there. It's not a fire stair per se. We have two fire stairs out of the mezzanine um, and therefore we could, actually bring a new security ADA entry and move up to the third, third floor of the cafeteria or within the building um, in that link area where the coat room is now, which makes sense. So um, I'm not sure what else, Alice, you would like me to add. Well, but... let me, I know we're gonna have some questions here, but let me just read and I sent it to Phil to post on our webpage, but let me read what the recommendation from the advisory committee is for the 1.5, because we would need to make this recommendation to the House Appropriations Committee to add this to the budget adjustment. So the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House recommends the Joint Management Committee and Joint Rules, which we did, but they haven't acted on it yet, um, that the FY22, <clears throat> Budget Adjustment Act include 1.5 million in funds to issue a request for proposal, an RFP, for programming and schematic design development for expansion of the State House. This shall include the infrastructure needs for any future phases of expansion. So that would be the language that we would submit to um, House Appropriations. Karen. Yes, I think you just answered 
my question because um, I was taking a lead from our conversation yesterday about the whole planning and programming phase of it. And I heard the schematic design and so wanted to um, ensure that we are incorporating that and not skipping ahead. But it sounds like what this 1.5 would be for is to include both of them. And I guess I would be curious to hear a bit more maybe we don't know it, but what would be in that planning phase? Because I feel like there are a lot of stakeholders. One thing I know I've heard, and I haven't even been in the building really, is about the cafeteria and how looking at a different cafeteria to um, serve, you know, increased number of folks could be. So if you can share more of what the programming phase would look like, that would be helpful. Okay. So um, I, I thought where I should start is maybe some folks don't understand the, the uh, like just the rudimentary architectural phases. So um, I'll, I'll start there. There's five. All right. So we have programming, which you just mentioned, which we would be reviewing the program with this 1.5 million and making sure the program is, is appropriate still. Um, we've reviewed the, we've had many programs that are very, very, very similar, all of them to be, and uh, therefore we'll review these programs, make sure we have the right um, intent and use for each space. Um, and that's what programming does. And part of the programming uh, would be for the owners uh, and the legislators approval of the, fit, of the, um, the programming and the estimate, there would be an estimate at that time. Um, and before Trisha, we- Tricia, can I just interrupt? And for the programming phase, it does include like the stakeholders weighing in. That's correct. Is that right? Okay. That's correct. All right. And, um, so the, the next phase of uh, if a, a program, when the, if the program is approved by all the stakeholders, just put it as one word there, meaning the representative, uh, the, the uh, owner and the legislature and the, uh, the users, we move to schematic design. So that's phase number two in, in um, a architectural development. Um, and that is basically, you'll see sketches of um, the program and how it could be laid out uh, and how the spaces could be um, laid out. And then that, those documents are reviewed by fire safety, historic preservation, capital complex, and of course the users and the, um, of, of the, uh, the space and those that are involved in the development of the space. Um, at that time, I would like to, <clears throat> I propose that, um, the an estimate is done again and when, that is reviewed and all of those authorities that have jurisdiction over this project review everything and sign off so that can be very time consuming that's another problem is if if people are timely in their review process then obviously we we move further and um, down the road the next phase, if we have a schematic design that everybody says, this is great, you know, we're, we're moving forward. Everybody's basically uh, on board with the plan um, and the development of how it moves forward. Then you go into design development, it, it's called. And the owner, uh, again, and the legislative user, so all the uh, review and have to approve that design development. and another estimate at that time, the DD estimate, design development estimate. And again, the project will be reviewed by fire safety, historic preservation, capital complex, environmental will, will take place at that time. Um, and <clears throat> we'll have to look into uh, how that will affect us Act 250 and any environmental codes, uh, flood mitigation, uh, stormwater runoff, such like that. Uh, how it affects the city of Montpelier and such. But this all goes through the capital complex. That's who we report to and um, on and the development of the exterior of the project. And we are we'd write an RFP at that point in design development for a construction manager. 
So construction manager, I'm advising we go with versus a general contractor um, because of the complexity of this project and moving around uh, the schedule is very complex, first of all, and also building in the back of, of building where we are, we're building into the side of a mountain or the side of a, the hill. And uh, it, that is a feat in itself. And I think that a, a, uh, a good construction manager would be advantageous on this project and, and help us move through. Um, and uh, one was used, we used, I used a construction manager when I did the dome, uh, the restoration of the dome. That was, um, I'm, I'm sorry. And that was a, uh, a, um, <clears throat> successful project because of it being worked with a construction manager at that time. Um, and at that point in design development too, I would like to hire a commissioning agent to review the project and to oversee on the owner's behalf to make sure everything is um, coordinated. Along with that we'll be having mechanical work happening at the same time, I think too, and making sure everything's coordinated and all the pieces are, mat, are um, reviewed by another separate engineer uh, that would make sure that hopefully that we have things tagged is the, the intent of that. And that would bring us through the 1.5 million. At that point, we would have a design development drawings that been approved, hopefully, an estimate that's approved. And then the additional funding would be requested to proceed on with construction documents. Construction documents would be the drawings that would be used for bidding the project, uh, which includes uh, a, a full set of drawings, specifications, and um, approval, review approval of, uh, and final submittal for permits to fire safety, environmental, and um, talking to the construction manager about constructability and reviewing and making sure that is all working out. And uh, again, the uh, commissioning agent, uh, having them verify that the CDs and the building systems are coordinated to meet owner's uh, requirements and uh, the final review of all the documents for bidding. So um, in the final phase, is construction and uh, the bidding process and then the actual construction. So those are the five phases of architectural, and I'll go through them again. It's programming, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and then bid construction, period. So the 1.5 gets us through to three stages. And at each stage, you refine a little bit more in terms of what the plan is, and you refine those cost estimates for the project cost. What we're looking at right now in ballpark figure, we don't know, but an expansion over the cafeteria and converting the cafeteria space to committee rooms and doing some other internal work in the current committee rooms would run anywhere from 20 to 24 million for that. But we, you know, those are ballpark. It could be very, very different. And that's why we want to give a jump start on this because uh, if we're going to use ARPA funds, we have to get those dollars out the door in a time specific manner. Uh, Janet? Thank you, Madam Chair. And with your memory and Tricia's memory, when we were in the advisory committee, I know that we talked about inflation costs originally, uh, and I can't recall, was the 1.5 million, at, did we feel like that was a comfortable, uh, where we ended up with that number? Or did we want to go a little higher because of inflation and the time, and time restrictions for everybody? Janet, we went between 1 million and 2 million. I know we were talking around 2 million as well, but we felt the 1.5 was probably more acceptable. Okay. So I just flagged that, Madam Chair, in case, you know, if you, you know, would have other discussions, we wouldn't want it to inhibit us from going forward if we were 
a little bit short. And I know we're talking big numbers here, but that maybe JFO could at some point mm -hmm. weigh in with you. Yeah. I mean, we can make a request of approves for 2 million. I mean, it doesn't mean we're going to get any of it. Mm -hmm. but, but the question was, we could, the thinking is that we need, we're in a very short time frame to get this project done if we can use ARPA money. So in order to jumpstart it, if we went through the regular capital bill process within our capital bill, the money would not be available until May to begin any of the programming or looking at any schematic designs or anything. So right there, you're six months lost. So that's why the thinking was to, for the general fund budget adjustment to get this started a few months in advance. So that's the thinking. So we have a couple of questions, uh, Scott and then Karen. Um, yeah, I was just wondering who we have to hire specifically in order to, to kick off um, programming and pre, pre whatever it is, pre-planning and design. So the question is, we need to make a decision. Do we appropriate this money to BGS to be our entity that works in going out with the RFP to do the hiring? Or, right. Or do we fund the money through our sergeant at arms for them to do the work? Because that's the big question. Okay, um, sure. I guess I was asking a, a, a little different my focus is a little different in, in that I'm wondering who we have to hire um, in order to do this work. Is it just an architect? You need an entity to go out and develop the RFP to go hire somebody. So the money needs to go to that entity. So the money okay. either goes this is just... to the US or it goes to the sergeant at arms. Okay, so it's just for the developing the RFP. Correct. You've got to do the RFP first to go out to get a firm to actually go out and do the programming and schematic design. Okay. Um, uh, it, it's, it seems like a lot of money to, to develop an RFP. I, I guess I'm wondering what, what is entailed, what's involved. The Maybe RFP, the RFP, Trish just went through it. There'd be three things we would be looking for in the RFP when we go out to hire a firm. They would be looking at the programming that would be needed. They'd be developing the schematic design and then they would go into those design documents. No, no, I, that's, what the, that's what the RFP would be for. But the 1.5 million is to, is, to pay for going, is, is to pay for developing the RFP. Is that what you just said? Do that work, the RFP, you've got to develop the RFP first Right. Before you can go out and bid for an architectural firm to be able to do the programming, schematic design, and design development, the 1.5 includes those three phases to pay for them. Right. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Somehow I got the crossways. Uh, Karen and then Marsha. Yes. I have two questions now because another one came up as we were talking. Um, so I guess one, it would be um, based on what you just said, Madam Chair, of figuring out, do we go with the Sergeant of Arms or going out with, um, go with BGS? I guess I would um, appreciate a conversation of better understanding the pros and cons of it. I don't feel like I really understand what is the difference and why one would be better over the other. So that's one question. Um, the other one I'm wondering in, um, I believe Trisha, you shared this, that the um, kind of design development phase can um, be, you know, go smoother or slower depending on the review process from the different stakeholders and um, users. Uh, do we feel like we have good buy-in from those people that they understand that they're going to have to be making decisions along the way, that they have capacity, that they're on board with this, or do we, like, to inform us, do we think it's gonna go fast or slow? The stakeholders are the legislative leadership, legislative branch. Great. That's the stakeholders. Okay. 
So it's different than other construction where you're dealing with other groups and advocates and all of that. Where this would be a legislative focus in legislative decisions. It would be made with institutions committees. It would be made with leadership of the House and Senate. It would be made with joint management committee and joint rules. That's the process. So and I guess I can assume then that we're all on board with making sure it moves in the time that's needed to get the funds out the door. Right. So and I guess my only question then is understanding Sergeant of Arms versus BGS, if we can have that conversation at some point. We talked about that in the advisory committee. Um, and the question is, you really need whoever oversees this whole RFP and project development needs to be very astute in construction. Um, I don't know, Janet, if you want to weigh in. <laughs> well, so obviously that is not me. It just so we're all clear about that, I'm not going to be. We, um, so when we had discussed it with hiring Tricia for these jobs that we're doing now, and I just want to give the committee a little bit of history from Tricia, for Tricia, that she has been here through um, the thick and thin of the renovations of the state house since uh, what was the year, Tricia? Uh, 1994. 1994. So uh, Tricia used to work for BGS. And I think that uh, in my um, consideration of hiring Tricia too, was of her knowledge that she really has the most knowledge about this building of, of anyone, including folks at BGS. And, you know, Joe's been there right there with her too, as well. And I mean, Joe has an entity of the whole state to take care of. And we always uh, appreciate Joe. I think one thing would be, um, if anything, if the sergeant at arms did take it on with hiring someone as Tricia, then I think everything would kind of be in consultation with buildings and general services as well. But Madam Chair, do you recall what we did talk about that in the advisory committee? And the advisory committee kind of felt it would be a really heavy load for a sergeant at arms office to handle all of this, because this is a big project. This isn't just a tiny little project of converting a committee room. Right, like Wh been, which in yeah. fact, we would hire someone it, and it wouldn't be, I think it would really be the person that we hired working for the legislature, not just the sergeant at arms. But uh, you may have other feelings about that, Madam Chair. And uh, the other folks may want to weigh in as to, you know, the, the amount of workload. I mean, they did not have the ability to <clears throat> help us with small projects right now. I think this would be a huge project for buildings and general services too. And they would probably have to hire it out, hire an architect as well, or and maybe Joe could weigh in on that. I'm not sure. So the discussion we had in the advisory committee was that to carry this whole construction project, the department or the entity that would really be overseeing all of this, though they'd be hiring out for the construction and, and project manager, it's it would be the legislative branch. It really would be. And do we want to be in the role of BGS to oversee all that construction? That's really the issue. So does that help, Karen? Does that help folks? It does. I, and I think as we continue, probably get clearer. Thank you. So we have more questions, Marsha, Linda, and Kurt. Um, I just feel bad that Mr. Peon Eric can't speak up for BGS and let us know what their feelings are on this. I mean, we're hearing what Janet's are and we can't hear what BGS has to say. And it kind of leaves us out there saying that it looks looking like BGS wants nothing to do with it. I mean, that's just my own personal feeling. And I just kind of would like to hear both sides of the story. Uh, I don't know if you want to weigh in, Eric. Madam Chair, I think at this point you're you could almost have a generic conversation about which is the more efficient way to run a project 
and what is the capacity of the two entities to execute that project. They're you know, setting aside the question of whether or not the project will or will not be approved in the end. I mean, there, there are advantages to um, BGS running a project. Um, if, if this project were to be approved and assigned to BGS, it would be right there alongside the women's correctional facility and police barracks and all of our other projects. It's no secret that across industry and government, there are major capacity issues with staffing right now. Um, so if we, if BGS were to execute this project, we may well wind up contracting that work out. And so it's, it's in, in many ways, a question of who do you want moving your paper almost. Is that helpful mm -hmm. at all? And Joe will speak up if I'm uh, going way off the rails, but I, you know, I think independent of the question of supporting or not supporting the project, you can have a conversation about what the most efficient movement would be if it occurred. So you would have the advantage on your side of potentially um, moving past some of the uh, bureaucratic obstacles which exist in the executive branch by design, um, but you also would be on your own. So you can go either way. So Eric, when you say we'd be on our own, hmm. it would be someone designated on the legislative arena to sign off and approve those construction documents that a firm would present to us. Right, you, you would own the project. We would own the project. We'd have to make sure that all the contracts are in place for um, insured bonds or insured liability, insuring the project materials. Fire um, safety. Fire all, safety. all the permitting is in place, all the, um, code issues or in place, we'd have to look at those construction documents and approve them. Right. And, you know, in, in practice, you folks have done projects on your own in the past. And even if we weren't formally involved, we just, it, it's our nature. And we are, we are your neighbors and we are your partners in so many things that it, it, we can't not get involved in some way. But, um, you know, formally, you guys would be on the hook for the project. Is the state house considered one of the buildings that's under BGS? Is one of those buildings that we talked about yesterday that there are 240 state owned buildings that BGS? Is, is I have been trained to, to say and believe that this is our most important building. Um, there are certainly uh, some. Uh, things about the building that are unique in terms of how it's operated and, and governed, but it is a state building and it is our most important building. That's why you see our people uh, working so hard on the glass walls in the cafeteria every day. Does that Guys, help? Oops, sorry, Eric. Does that help, Marcia, at all? Okay. And then Kurt. Um, thank you. Uh, can you tell me how much experience the Sergeant of Arms Office has in initiating and monitoring these types and levels of projects? Would you like me to answer that, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. So we've had just a few projects, Representative Sullivan, and it, it, and it became obvious that I could not manage that. I'm not a construction person. So that's why we did hire Tricia. And um, in this, you know, I was involved with the dome stuff, just going to meetings, but it wasn't anything that, you know, I, I was just weighing in on our perspective for, you know, the work that was being done, you know, logistics for, you know, people coming in and out and all of that. So you're correct. And that I'm not qualified to do that, nor is anyone else in the Sergeant at Arms office. I think it's a matter of hiring uh, the, the person as uh, an architect of our own. And we did go out and hire Freeman French and Freeman for advice on other projects as well. Um, I think the advantage I see in 
and you can call it the sergeant at arms or you could call it the legislature doing this on their own is by hiring their own architect. That is a, for the beginning of all these stages. That is the beginning of, that's their thing that they're doing. It's not, we're not shared and have to, as Eric pointed out, the bureaucratic business that BGS has to do. And I'm not saying we don't follow good practices and that kind of thing, we do. But if, if we hire the right person to manage this for the legislature in conjunction with including BGS, because they are our partners in a lot of things here for maintenance and uh, institutional knowledge at the state house. Um, I feel like the advantage is us for us to have our own. Um, and I'm just one sergeant at arms that comes and goes, you know, and this is a long term project. So everyone needs to, you know, you'd have to be comfortable with the person that we hired. Um, thank you. So BGS would not be participating at all in the in, in the RFP process. It would be say if you retain Trisha's firm, you would be reliant upon her firm to be doing this. Is that correct? So more of an independent contractor. I, th I think so, Madam Chair. Would that be your take? Trisha, Trisha is there to work for the legislative branch. That's her position. It's okay, very thank you. Yeah. Okay. I do think it's part of a bigger conversation that we're having now. So I'm not, you know, it's you all have, have making good points about <clears throat> it too. And this all came up in the advisory committee, and we we didn't make a decision. Uh, Kurt, and then Marshall, and then I'm um, I'm a little concerned about the timeline, and I think uh, Representative Dolan's question was a good one regarding who has to do the reviewing of these things. And my understanding was that along the way, it's not just the legislature and all those various committees, but it's also the fire marshal and the Capitol complex and perhaps the cafeteria company that's using the cafeteria. All those people are going to weigh in at the various stages of the project. And it's a, to me, it's a good question. How committed are they to getting this done by 2026? Because uh, our experience is that projects can take a long time. So I'm a little concerned about that and, and not sure how that gets resolved. Um, I, would, I also agree with Marsh. I'd like to hear more from the administration as to why they're not in favor of it. I understand Eric's point of view, and, and I can see that uh, giving them another project might be an overload, and that's kind of another whole question. But the administration has some, is the reason that they're not interested in this a question of capacity, or is it because they think it's a bad idea for some other reason? And if it's for some other reason, then I, I'd like to know what that is um, in order to see whether it's a good, good idea to, to progress. I suspect that if we go down this road, it will be the expansion to the capital. There will be no more discussion of adding wings on the other sides because we'll say we've already expanded by putting it on the cafeteria. We don't need to consider those anymore. So we're kind of choosing a route for the future along those lines. Um, the other thing that I was hearing was, um, Madam Chair, you were saying we would have to approve the drawings and we would have to do, and I'm not sure who we is in that case, because I know I'm not qualified and I don't know if, well, maybe this committee could can co collectively have the expertise to say, yes, these drawings look good. But uh, I get, my understanding would be that it's the person we hire, the construction manager who would make those decisions and say, yes, these, um, these, Fit, these are according to all the regulations and things. So I'm a little confused on who we is when you're the, the approval of the various stages. The we would be the legislative branch. So that means what about three different committees? That would be leadership. <clears throat> leadership. It would be working with the Sergeant at Arms. It would be working with Trisha. It would be working with Joint Management Committee. It would be working with Joint Rules Committee. It would be the legislative branch that would need to sign off on those documents. 
not BGS. Construction right, but would present those. This is what they would recommend, but somebody needs to look at those documents and make sure that they're carrying through what is needed. All the permits would be in place, code review, all of that. It would be the legislative branch. So when I say we, I'm implying it's a legislative branch. So all these committees are going to look at the, the several committees are going to look at the drawings and say, you know, I think this needs to be moved over here. Does this fit the fire marshal's uh, requirements? And I think this wall looks too thick or something like that. It might be. I'm not sure how detailed it would get into, Tricia, for something like that. But someone has to sign off those construction documents beyond the the architectural firm. Somebody has to give the approval that, yes, we're going to go ahead with this. And it, it, it is a step-by-step -step process for the review of the documents. And I, I understand what you're saying. I think it's a good point. There does need to be some kind of a group committee that formed in, to uh, represent those different groups so that they can sign off on it, I would think would be the best way to approach that, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Well, look, look at it this way. If we're signing off, whose signature is it? <laughs> well, that's the question. We don't know because it's we not. don't have that structure in place. It, we don't know. Would it be the Sergeant Arms and the total Sergeant Arms responsibility after consulting with all the legislative um, committees like joint management and joint rules and your speaker and your Senate pro tem and all of that? Yeah, well, I can't, I can't see going forward with a project and we don't know who's going to approve it. That's what we're discussing right now. Would this be under the jurisdiction of the legislative branch or would we appropriate the money to BGS for them to be the driver? That's what we're trying to figure okay. out. Okay, and, and, and I'm saying that if we're saying it's the legislative branch, I, I need something more specific than just the legislative branch because I can't see somehow the le unless we do it by resolution or something i don't see how the legislature can approve schematic drawings unless we unless we define an entity to do that and say okay here's a, a steering committee for this project and they are the ones that are responsible for putting their signatures on the drawings and saying this is correct mm -hmm. yeah that's what we're grappling with so to okay. answer your question about why BTS is in the position they're in, the administration voted no on this memo. They did not support putting 1.5 million in the governor's proposed budget adjustment. The governor proposes the funding. The governor proposed the general fund budget adjustment in the middle of December to our House Appropriations Committee. This was not in it. It comes from the governor. The proposal for BAA comes from the governor. BGS <laughs> is part of the executive branch. They're part of the administration. Uh, uh, that, that makes sense. Um, now we are proposing a project which is the second floor of the cafeteria. I would like to know what BGS and the administration think of that as an idea for future expansion of the capital. Do I, they think that's a good idea or a bad idea? I don't care where, well, I do care, but at this point, I'm not asking how should it be funded? I'm asking, is it the way that we should expand the capital? And if the administration is saying, no, we, don't, we think it's a bad idea because we have another plan for something else or there's um we found that what we want to do is put the uh wood-fired boiler down in the certain place they may have all kinds of reasons for not supporting this aside from the financial one and if there are those then i want to know what they are because we might be making the wrong decision it's fine if they just say no we 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 think the project is okay, but we don't want to pay for it this way. That's an entirely different matter. So I don't know how Eric or Joe can respond to this. I don't want to put you in a corner. Um, I know you need to speak for the executive branch. 
executive branch and the legislative branch of two separate branches of government. And this is a building that the legislature operates out of and maybe the administration just doesn't feel a need to be a part of that dis preliminary discussion. I don't know. Eric? Madam, this, <laughs> this is actually the moment where I say the thing that uh, causes distress <laughs> because it's often said in almost in jest, but in this moment, I have to say, I support the governor's recommend. I can certainly consult with my superiors to see a more uh, granular explanation of the reasoning behind the governor's recommend could be offered, but it was not in the governor's proposed budget. And that's all the message I have available today. I can, I can check and see if I can offer more, but I have nothing more today. That's fine with me. And if, if, uh, if Eric could find out and say, you know, is there some reason aside from the fact that we didn't think of it to put it in the, in the recommend or we don't like the financing of it, then let us know for sure, because it might be important. Many things are proposed in the, gov in, in the budget process by us, by agencies, by you, and uh, those that appear in the governor's recommend are the ones that we support. So that's where we're at. Um, Okay, so we have a couple yep. more, uh, Marsha, and then Sarah. Scott, you dropped out. Are you still in the queue? Okay, Marsha and then Sarah. This, this could be funded by one-time ARPA money. We don't have to go borrow money. We don't have to use capital funds. Somebody should get off the top of the can here and go make a plunge and do this because it's our one and only chance. I mean, just think about it. That money will go down the drain if we don't use it. I mean, and I think that, yes, BGS, that's kind of their job. And if that's their most important building, I think that uh, they should be in charge of it and find a way to fit it into their plans because this is a one-shot deal we have. Jana, do you have a response or do you want to be in the queue? Um, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I... I think that uh, Representative Martel, it, it's like hitting the button there. And I think she's right in that uh, if the governor, in all due respect, has other plans for that money, I think it's up to the legislature to advocate that this is a need that we have. And um, and like for Hoover takes care of the project or does, does the project, you know, doesn't matter to me. I'm um, just invested in what's right for the, the state capital. I do know that uh, in other projects, BGS have not, they've just haven't had the bandwidth to do it as I haven't and we haven't. And that's why we do hire someone such as an architect. And then that architect hires the other construction managers and all of that kind of piece. And then uh, I think uh, the other question was about the stakeholders and who would be on board with that. I mean, I think that's all gonna take a push for people because like the Capitol complex, we met with them on lighting. They only meet once every so often. Uh, they agreed to update the lighting around the state house uh, with in reasonable uh, accommodations to the neighbors. So, you know, the city as well, the, all that as a stakeholder is into when we do construction work, especially to this magnitude. And then I'm just not sure about the other question about uh, if we go above the cafeteria, does this put the hold on any other expansion project if needed down the road? And Madam Chair, I think you had alluded to that whatever we did going up <laughs> on any place would not restrict any other advancement of construction, so. I just and throw those things out there, Madam the, Chair. The memo, the memo said that this shall include the infrastructure needs for any future phases of expansion. So down the road, if, if 20 years from now, the legislative branch wants to build a wing on to one side, at least the infrastructure for, care, for the electrical and for the heating and all of that is built within that expansion above the cafeteria. 
to accommodate that because that's what they did back in the 80s. Sarah? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I appreciate, so appreciate Representative Martel's comment and I was gonna speak to that a little bit. Um, and I think we are asking the, all the right questions this committee, uh, you know, the, the chain of command and decision, the decision-making process. But I, so I had, I think this, since the, the three years that I've been on the committee, it's my fourth year, the state house and the, the space constraints of the state house has been an issue and then COVID hit. And that's, you know, we've, I've in my short time have already received and read several reports on how to address it. And it seems like this is a moment and I, uh, to address some of our long-term needs, um, our immediate short-term needs and our long-term needs. So one of the questions I had, and I wanted to get some clarification from Tricia about, Tricia, your role, your role, and then also what you're proposing. To me, it sounded like one of the things that you were proposing is that in this process that we would, you would recommend using a construction manager um, as well as a commissioning agent. And it's my understanding from what I heard you say that a commissioning agent is the um, owner's representative, but that doesn't mean that makes the decisions without all of the stakeholders. But in this case, the timeline is pretty complex, not just because of the complexity of the construction project itself, but in the decision-making process. You laid that out pretty clearly, I thought. So it, one of the, I, I think the commissioning agent is something that we should pay attention to. I think that's a very interesting recommendation. Um, and it is something similar to what I think BGS would do. And you having, you're, you worked for BGS, we're so lucky to have you and your depth of knowledge of the state house since 1994. I think we are very fortunate to have your, you involved in the, that the, advise, the state house advisory committee had the foresight to do that is, is terrific. So my question is, how long is this, is this a permanent position that you're in? Are you, could you be, to answer some of the committee's questions, like you could be in a way, could we think of you as our version of a BGS or how we, how we would on other projects would be looking towards BGS to oversee a project. That's my understanding that you would play that role. This isn't a temporary role. This is your, is that, is that correct? I have been hired on contract for a year. Yes. So okay. that, you know, I intend, you know, if it works all out, I'd like to continue and help you through all these projects uh, for the next few years. So um, that was my intent. Uh, I am, you know, because I've done BGS for many years, the uh, RFP process, the, the development of projects, et cetera, like that. But I do think that the word partnership was key that someone used earlier because I do need help from BGS to provide the RFP documents uh, necessary uh, uh, that is under their their realm of, of contracting. So it would still need the assistance or the partnership with BGS in order to uh, put this uh, RFP out on the street. I would also think it would be key if they were involved um, in this partnership and reviewing the RFP that I developed, um, if that was uh, something that the commissioner and uh, the governor would support. And the commissioner did work with us for our uh, like retainer contractors for two Aiken. And, you know, we had to do a legal, little wiggle room with them and meet with um, Jennifer and ask if we could use their contract and they agreed that we could. So that, that was great and we really appreciated that. Okay, so it sounds as if we have two decisions, right? Uh, Madam Chair, that one is about the, that we, we would, I know there'll be more discussion, but it's about the money in the BAA and then drilling down on some of the details on how the mechanics of this work. Um, Where does the money go? Yep. Where is it designated? And I know Scott has a question, but I want to ask a question of Tricia. So if we did it on our own, who's in the driver's seat in terms of working with that construction firm and applying the RFP? Is it the architectural firm? The, uh, yeah, the architectural firm 
uh, does work with the CM and also the project, which I'd be considered a project manager for you at that time, would also work in coordination uh, with all those uh, uh, individuals, the, the construction manager, um, the, uh, the owner, the, and the, and uh, any, any of the coordination that has to be through, but I would run everything through Janet. So it is a load on Janet that she has to approve certain things and um, review right. the and document, sign off on them too, in a lot of cases. And this is where, and this I'm speaking personal. This is my concern. Mm -hmm. We are my not, Janet's not a construction person. That's right. Trisha is, but Janet isn't. Legislators are not. Right. And we're putting a lot of faith in an architectural firm. And architectural firms can say, oh, you want this? Yeah, we can do this. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. Oh, you want this? Yeah, we can do this. Cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. So where's that check and balance? And that's a lot of weight to put on Trisha that has no staff and no backup. That's my concern. This is not a simple little project. This is a major construction project. Right. This is like doing a secure residential facility. This is like building a brand new state office building that you, you know, you need to know what you're doing. And my concern is putting all of this on to folks that this is not their world. That's my personal feeling. Madam Chair, I agree with you. Is there a way that this committee could uh, kind of noodle through something as a partnership? Because, you know, Tricia was hired originally to have the best interests of the legislature. At, and, and we still need that, I feel. Because buildings and general services, they have a lot of different projects. We're, and I know this is a, a priority for them, but we're not always... Uh, and in all due in all due respect they they don't have the the manpower we're working through an hvat project we're working through a two acre project because they did not they did not have the total time to to help us with that so i definitely think that the person that we hire to is looking out for all of us here at the state house and i don't know how we can coordinate that with whoever takes the project on and maybe, the, and that's still the question of what we're grappling with, I think. And I totally agree. I, you know, it's a, it, even these smaller projects were too much for me, which in fact, we had to hire Tricia and she's been a huge help. Like we couldn't have gotten this far, but the magnitude of this other big, huge project, I, I agree with you, Madam Chair. I mean, but this I could be a $5 million project. Right. It's not chunk change. No. It's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not, half, it's not a half million dollar project no. that Janet's been involved in. Um, you know, we fronted maybe around 500,000, 700,000 to Janet to do some of the renovations with the coat room and to Aiken. But the, when you're talking 20, $25 million project, it's, it's a major project. Um, I want to, I'm going to go to Scott and I'm looking at the time. I'd like to give about five minutes or so before we have to zoom in. Um, but it's Scott. Okay, well, so I agree with kind of everything that's been said mm -hmm. here, lately, starting with Marsha, uh, Marsha's observation that we got to do something. We have access to this money and we got we to do something. Um, and it doesn't seem like this is the kind of project that ought to be managed um, out of the Sergeant at Arms uh, office. This is exactly the kind of project the BGS ought to be handling. Um, and so, we're the legislature, we appropriate the money and the executive does the project, right? Does, executes the, what, what, we, what we've decided. Um, so it seems to me that that's, that's where the money ought to go. We've, we've hired Trisha, as I understand it now, to uh, represent the legislature's interests. Couldn't Trisha be there for our liaison to the to BGS to, uh, you know, to make sure that, that to, prod uh, things along, make sure that make sure that things keep going. I guess that's my, my observation. So Scott, that's very helpful. So let, let me put this on the table here and see if we can at least move off the dime on one thing. 
are the committee members in support of us making a recommendation to House Appropriations to jumpstart this project for 1.5 million? So I see Linda saying no. I'm seeing how many. I'm. Use your hands. Yeah, I see everyone. Larry, I'm, I'm saying I, I'm saying no because at this point I want more information. Okay, information in terms of who's going to be the lead. Where does the money go to? Because we got well that, but I think we really need to have an understanding from the administration, why, for what reason, I, you know, this, if we're doing a project, it needs to be laid out why we're doing it so that we're all on board to do it. I, I'm, I don't like this kind of, um, well, we don't, we don't know if it's because of the money or they don't like the project or they don't, whatever. It, this should be a pretty open discussion. And so I'll need a, a lot more information. I'll have to echo what Mary said. That's exactly how I feel. I think we need more before we can just, uh, just plunge forward without hearing, hearing more. And Linda, what are your thoughts? Um, so I would like to uh, hear more from the administration on their mm -hmm. concept, how they wanted to expand. And if we did something like this, would it inhibit the way they wanted to expand? And so I think it's far too premature at this point in time to do a piecemeal expansion. Even though everybody wants a bigger cafeteria, I don't think this is the time to go that route. We don't have enough information. Information. I don't have the confidence yet in who would be retained to oversee regardless of the qualifications of our legislative advisor. I need to see the whole project and what will go on and I really need input from the administration. Thank you. And if we take all this time to do all of this, that money's going down the drain every day. So we may not get an answer from the administration. And from my point of view, if we don't, it's not going to destroy anything, okay, over this particular year, the X amount of months left in this particular session with a $1.5 million investment. I think we don't need to do anything at this point in time. I don't think that you're going to lose a million five. You might lose, use it for something more beneficial at this point. Well, the, the, the issue was getting the whole project done in time to, to be within the ARPA timeframe, right? And that's what, 2026. So we got to go. Fisher laid out the time frame. All right. And this is a legislative branch. This is the building that we operate out of. The executive branch does not operate out of this building. This is a building that the legislative branch, the third branch, a separate branch of government operates under. And just keep that in mind. It's where we work. And who has jurisdiction and control of the workspace that we work? Do we do that? Or does the, a separate branch of government do that? Just putting that out on the table there. Uh, Larry and then Linda. Yeah, my concerns, um, I guess I would like to see 2 Aiken explored a little bit more. So I need a little bit more information. When BGS moved out to 133 State Street, that freed up, as I understand it, first and second floors, and yet this is the third three-story building. I understand the needs for the new wiring H VAC reconfigurations and possibly security, et cetera. So my question is, HR, where is human resources located? Is it in the Capitol building or is it offsite? They moved, they were in another building, not in the state house. They were in what we call the Pink Lady, um, which is right about the state house. They moved down to Two Aiken. Two Aiken is an old house and it's really chopped up. Mm -hmm. And legislative branch. In terms of legislators using that place for committee rooms or anything, it is just not feasible for that because you've got small office space in there and it's a three-story 
old house. So, so my next question is, is COVID driving the need for more space? You know, that's a good point. And I think we've got to, we, we've worked on balancing that. We've been talking about needing more space in the state house prior to COVID. The decision we make in terms of how we expand should be driven in terms of our work as a legislative body and not COVID. Because if COVID was driving this, we'd end up with a much bigger space. Okay. So we've been, the building, and it's unfortunate many of you have not been in the building during a session and how the building can get really cramped and how committee rooms on the house side can get really cramped. So we have to balance out how we can function and do our work, not in the world of COVID. That's what we're balancing right now with an expansion. It's not COVID that is driving the expansion. COVID drove us to move our committee room into another committee room. It drove room nine, 10, 11 in the lounge to be converted over to committee rooms on a temporary basis. COVID drove that, but that's not permanent. I don't know Can you describe to me the function of our mezzanine and legal counsel up there? The mezzanine is a floor in between uh, our main lobby floor and the upper floor where the cafeteria and the well and the committee rooms. The mezzanine is a space that's very limited in use because there are columns along that hallway that are weight bearing. So it'd be very, very difficult to convert that space into committee rooms. Our legal counsel, our lawyers, our lawyers, legislative lawyers that staff our legislative committees, that's where their offices are. And then there's also like our, our lawyer, Becky Wasserman, her office is in the Pink Lady. So there's some, some of our lawyers are separate from where the others are housed in the mezzanine. We have some lawyers who are housed in the Pink Lady. So the goal of getting to Aiken was to consolidate all of legislative council into one space so they're not so spread out. So if they were moved and all consolidated offsite out of this building in a the magic space, let's call it, it <laughs> may not be necessarily to Aiken. Um, has an architectural and engineering study been commissioned to look at the mezzanine? No, that's what this 1.5 would be to, you know, figure out what that one point, what the, where that, how that mezzanine space could be used. But before we even get there, leadership on the House and Senate side, Joint Management Committee needs to work with the leadership of the Legislative Council to come to some form of agreement if they're going to move or not to two Aiken. And if that was put on the table for the administration, do you think you could garner more support? The administration is a separate branch of government and they will probably not weigh in on this. This is where the legislative branch operates. The legislature is in the driver's seat in terms of this money. It is not the administration. We can appropriate the money to BGS and then BGS will do the work that they're being asked. But to keep looking to the governor and the administration for their approval, it's not, that's not the appropriate body. It's a legislative body. Okay, um, this question is more for Tricia. Um, when I was involved in construction projects at the hospital, we always hired a clerk of the works to oversee everything. What is the terminology you're using here? contract manager or? No, a clerk of the works is a, um, a representative, a owner's representative that is on site that um, makes sure the contractors are following the documents uh, according to the architectural, the owner, and, uh, and making sure that the owner is, uh, has 
you know, the uh, proper permits in place or, or uh, if doors need to be opened or the contractor needs access, you know, they, they oversee that, make sure that they're there to watch that contractor are the eyes on site. Uh, the clerk of the work says. So yes, I'd be advised that that uh, during the construction process that uh, and the bid just prior to bidding that the clerk of the works be hired as a separate consultant to the owner. Thank you. So who would the clerk of the work answer to? Would it be to the architectural firm or to you, Tricia, if we did it in-house? Yes, it would be um, to the owner. So the answer to uh, Janet and myself um, as her representative. And uh, so, and then they also, you know, that that's who they answer to, yes. And, and they also look to make sure that the architect's drawings are being um, followed. And if there was a difference, then they would need to, uh, let, uh, they would make the architect aware, but typically they're just there for the owner representative as the eyes on the site and anything that needs to be done, water turned on, electric turned off, fire sprinklers, smoke detectors, you know, they, anything that needs to happen during that day of construction, they handle that for you. So for this last project we, uh, we had in the um, coat room, I just did it, it was, uh, um, and Janet and her security staff uh, because we didn't have enough time to hire them, a, a clerk of the works, unfortunately. So. Uh, um, but it worked out. Thank you. Um, it's 1030. Linda, you had your hand up. Do you want to go? And then we've got to really scoot to this other Zoom meeting and we'll pick up this. I'm fine. Larry covered what um, some of the things that I was going to say, actually. So I'm good. Okay. So we'll revisit this. Um, we're not done. We need to figure out something. Um, and We'll work trying to schedule something later on today, possibly. Um, and then we'll go from there. And I, Sarah, I spoke earlier, uh, Mary, you and I and Phil need to get together at some point for scheduling. So if we could do kind of connect after a Zoom meeting, um, I don't know, around 12, maybe we could meet, but I'm not sure. But we got to get That's on to fine joint meeting. Mary? I said that's fine. So you want us to come back after the joint hearing around noontime to do scheduling? Yeah, why don't, why don't we quickly plan on that if that works? And we should use the Zoom that we're on right now, the committee Zoom. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay so let's scoot over to the other Zoom meeting. And Thank you, Madam Chair. For YouTube, we are done and we...